wonderful. Thank you all. <laughs> no, you're good. You're good. Thank you all so much for being here, both in person and online. It's so wonderful to see people in person. It's been a long summer, so we're really getting more folks here into the center. So bozo, that is a way to say hello or a formal type of greeting in Potawatomi. My name is Adriana Black, and I am the founding director of the Odette Manon Health Equity Center, or Odette Center for short. On behalf of my team, I want to welcome you all to our Odette Manon Health Equity Speaker Series, the first of the new academic year, titled Diversity Practices in the Dolores and Soledad Study, Implications for Clinical Research with Older Latinx Adults. This program is being recorded. For a bit of background, Odette Manan translates to this heart of ours in Potawatomi. The Potawatomi people are one of the original peoples of the Chicagoland area and one of the Three Fires Confederacy nations who know this area as their ancestral home. I want to give full credit, appreciation, and gratitude to Donald Parrott, our friend, language expert, and elder who has been on the journey of creating this space since its inception one year ago this week and has provided all translations. Today, I am joined by Dr. David Camacho from the UIC College of Applied Health Sciences. Over the course of the academic year, we will be spotlighting the seven health sciences schools and colleges. And in this series, we are spotlighting the College of Applied Health Sciences in the first speaker series of the academic year. Stay tuned for the UIC Jane Addams College of Social Work next month with Dr. Andrew Fole. Dr. David Camacho is an assistant professor in the Department of Disability and Human Development at the University of Illinois Chicago. He earned his PhD in social work and advanced clinical practice at Columbia University. His postdoctoral training is in behavioral geriatrics from the Wheel Cornell Medicine Department of Geriatrics and Palliative Medicine. Dr. Camacho's research focuses on developing and testing strategies that enhance the prevention and management of prevalent and morbid conditions associated with aging amongst Latinx and other minoritized adults. His work has been supported by the Columbia Center for Interdisciplinary Research on Alzheimer's Disease Disparities, Cornell's Translational Research Institute on Pain in Later Life, and the National Institute of Aging. His research is informed by his extensive clinical practice as a bilingual English and Spanish and bicultural Mexican and American clinical social worker, as well as his personal experiences as a caregiver. And without further ado, I want to welcome Dr. Camacho. Thank you so much. Okay, yes, please do. Please do come on up. You'll either pick one or the other. Pick this? Okay, so then. Hello. There we go. Cool. Yay. Hello. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for that introduction, Adriana. Um, I'm lucky to be here. Thank you for the invitation. So what I was hoping before I get going on all this, she already said my whole life story there. So, uh, but I rather have a conversation. I have way too many slides and I'd much rather have a conversation with people here and people online. So people online, feel free to jump in, raise your hand. I think we're monitoring, monitoring what's online, right? Who's Absolutely. online? And so I if people have questions as they come up, please pause and let's have a conversation because I think there's so much to discuss and so little time. So don't let me uh, call you out, Hugo, Monica, Diana, <laughs> you know, just saying. If you want to join in the conversation and turn on your cameras, we encourage it. We can see everyone's blank screens right now, which is fine, which is fine. But please feel free to interact with us in any way possible. We're monitoring the chat. Ugo, thank you. Yay. <laughs> thank you see, for no pressure. There yeah, we go. Thank you for turning on the camera. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. But we can't see my screen, right? I mean, for... You can, we can still see it over All there. Right. Can you pin it, Tatanya, his slides? I think we have the Odie Center instead. Everyone's or just go back to the other one, but I just want to make sure that okay. people jump into the conversation. There you go. All right. And this doesn't work. OK. Yeah.
Okay. Uh, I guess I have to start off with a little bit of funding support. I have to thank the, uh, you know, uh, funders, uh, support from uh, my postdoc, and also support from the Columbia Interdisciplinary Center, um, and mentors, Dr. Dr. Reed, Dr. Weddington, uh, and I have to thank the research assistants, uh, Giselle Mora, Kelly Pacheco, and Todd Baker, Becker, sorry, not Baker, Becker. And most importantly, the participants for these studies, because we would not be able to do any of this without participants, right? Uh, all right, so my prayer messages today, and I'll break this down and we'll start having a conversation because I think I see anywhere from undergrad to hopefully PhD level and different professors, so please feel free to ask. The main message today is that we should be thinking about trauma-informed principles, particularly when we're talking about diversity and using diversity in doing research with older Latinx communities. Uh, most of my work has focused on older Latinx communities, so that's where I'm focusing on today. This is a form of addressing issues of diversity it, I'm talking about research, not just data collection, but across the continuum of doing research from the very beginning, before you even start thinking about the questions of the population from the very beginning, all the way to publication, dissemination of findings. And another thing is that diversity is not about checking boxes. It's not about, oh, look, we have three of these or four of those, and this is a perfect box. There is no such thing. There are no perfect boxes. Life is messy. Embrace it, right? We're really talking about experiences. We're talking about emotions, culture, context, history, unfortunately, political history certainly impacts uh, how people experience these supposed boxes, right? And then I'll get into some practical practice of diversity. So some of the strategies that I use in order to engage older Latinx individuals while addressing issues of diversity. And finally, we'll get into recommendations for future work with older Latinx communities. Does that make sense? Does that work? Anybody hate it? Anybody tell me to go home? <laughs> All right, has anybody heard of trauma-informed principles? Yay, mm -hmm. can you tell me what those are? <laughs> they're, they're listed on there. Oh, great. Um, well, <laughs> yes, yes. Right, so these are some principles that were developed with the acknowledgement that exposure to potentially traumatic events is being recognized as an important piece that happens far too often uh, out in the real world that people that we really should consider that trauma may impact the way people engage in services, whether or not they receive services. And now I'm bringing it over a little bit more to research. There isn't so much of a discussion in research, right? Number six there, you see cultural, historical, and gender issues. That's really getting at that diversity piece. The thing about these principles is that it's not just one at a time. They work with each other and across principles, right? One major gap in the literature is, well, what does this actually look like in real world practice? Yeah, sure, we should be paying, paying attention to the safety of individuals, but what does that look like? Uh, we want it to be emotionally and psychologically safe. We also want, it, we want to build trust and, tra and be transparent with our participants. We want to develop peer support if we can. For example, we're doing a, a group intervention. We want to allow them to have their peer support. Uh, collaboration, addressing power dy dynamics. When we do research, and even as clinicians, we're, there's a power differential there. We're the ones in control. We're the ones giving a diagnosis. We're the ones uh, coding their data. And also think about empowerment, voice, and choice. Many people are not represented in the literature, so oftentimes, so like we have to allow to listen and actually allow space for people to tell their stories and not necessarily tell their stories in the language that we want to hear. So that's also important. And then pay attention to cultural, historical and gender issues, which again is complex. That varies per population, per subgroup. It's messy, it's messy. So I'm just providing some of the ways we did this in our current studies. Another important piece of trauma-informed principles is that we really need to pay attention to growth and resilience. Um, oftentimes what we hear about trauma is that there's a victim mentality to trauma. A person is exposed to a potentially traumatic event. Either we think PTSD or we think that, oh my God, this really has impacted them negatively. A lot of people do not develop PTSD. Something like 90% of older adults have been exposed to at least one potentially traumatic event. Most of them are not developing PTSD. Why is that? Because people are able to grow from experience. They able, they're resilient. So not everyone is a victim. So we need to pay attention to the growth and positive aspects of exposure to potentially traumatic event. And also pay attention to culture and context. This matters, particularly when we're thinking of whether or not people receive services right, for any of these potentially traumatic events. 
So it's a much broader topic what we're talking about. It's not, it's not, oh, the cat died, trauma, stop it. That's not the way it works, okay? Uh, all right, so one of the first things, not that I wanna talk about myself, but any type of trauma-informed care, trauma-informed research starts with you, right? So before you get into research, before you get into clinical work, you're really thinking about, well, why are you doing this work? We as, as individuals are research tools. We need to think about what do we bring to the table? What do we bring to the table, right? Um, so Jason, we've had these conversations early on. So Jason, raise your hand, is one of my research assistants at this point here at UIC. And this is one of the first exercises I had them do. We had to think about why we're doing what we're doing, right? So at minimum, you should be asking, um, why are you doing this research or this clinical work with older Latinx communities? How does your, your project support the well-being of older Latinx individuals? It's not just about me. It's not about the publication. It's not just me about getting recognition. I don't need to prove that to anybody that I'm smart. I'm not, but you know, those kind of things, right? And we all have a story, so we need to understand ourselves. We're not immune to trauma, for example. Uh, our own history is a source of knowledge. We need to think about why we do what we do, why we assume what we assume, and I will say straight out, I'm not objective. It's not a coincidence that what I do is, it comes from somewhere. And I'm very transparent about that. And also it's important to be transparent with yourself in order to actually be transparent with participants. You can't be transparent with them if you're not transparent to yourself. Does that make sense? Nobody's gonna challenge me on that. Be like, no, this is wrong. All right, so usually when I write a paper or a discussion as Adriana mentioned, I study minority aging, I study a lot of things. And there's a basic reason for this, right? I've been focusing more on loneliness and chronic pain in the past few years, but when working with older adults, these things often happen all together. <laughs> they rarely happen by themselves. So you really have to think about how these happen in the real world. Um, I could talk about my education that was already mentioned. I'm a social worker by training I'm from Southern California, PhD from Columbia and postdoc at Cornell. But that's not really it. Um, I could also talk about my clinical research experience before going back to school, right? Working in primary care, working at different agencies, uh, providing direct services, mental health care, emergency department, all fun stuff, right? You see out in the real world that services uh, are not necessarily designed for certain groups, particularly old, older Latinx individuals, Spanish speakers, uh, those who identify as sexual gender minorities, those who are immigrants, right? So there are a lot of gaps out there. So, you know, when you're out in the field, you see a lot of this stuff and you're thinking, well, what the hell am I gonna do about it? Like, so that's part of it, right? But really in full transparency, my experiences as, as a caregiver is really what drives my work. My parents immigrated to the US in the 1970s. My father attempted to migrate to the US in the 1960s. He was deported like three or four times, trying to work in the field. They were illegal immigrants. And I put that in quotes because it's a conversation point, right? Um, this even 50 years later, we're still talking about people being illegal. This is a problem. And we have to think about the impact it has on people across generations. It, they had low levels of education, eventually working out in the fields, working out in factories, they develop multiple chronic conditions, diabetes, um, cardiovascular disease, end stage renal disease, dialysis, you name it. So I learned how to navigate fragmented systems of care, fortunately and unfortunately. And my own experiences, I have a year round tan, for those of you who can't tell, I'm bilingual, Mexican and American. I'm also a cisgender gay man. It is what it is, right? I'm a gerontological social worker and researcher. That's not a coincidence. But really what drives it is when I was a caregiver, my mother would often say, todo tiene solución, menos la muerte, right? So I could bitch and complain as much as I want about the problems, but we got to find solutions to these things. And that's what I'm focusing my energy on. That makes sense? And a shameful plug for those um, for those publications. Um, so it's not a it's not a coincidence that my goals are to develop, implement, adapt interventions that already exist and try to get them out to older Latinx communities. Chronic pain and loneliness, major problems, major research priorities in the literature. We know very very little about these issues in older Latinx communities. Same thing with cognitive impairment. We basically know that older Latinos are what is it one and a half times more likely than whites to develop. Alzheimer's. Why and how? Many possible reasons. Are we doing much? Very few people are, right? Definitely not enough. 
Um, and then in order to do that, to develop these interventions, we have to better understand problems. So I engage in quantitative and qualitative research. We really need to dig in there and understand why these things look the way they do, right? I say at the bottom there, research is not apolitical. I stand by that, meaning that who gets research, what gets research, who is represented is not a coincidence. You know, there's a reason why minoritized groups are not represented. And for that same reason, I refuse to focus solely on quantitative work because we need to listen to people. Numbers themselves don't tell the full story and oftentimes stories themselves do not include numbers. So we really need to think about different ways of looking at the world. All right, so let me pause there for a second. Any questions, are we good? Do we need coffee? Are we good? <laughs> Don't fall asleep on me because, you know, uh, Cassandra, you gave me some really strong coffee. It is very strong. I'm feeling it. I added like three creamers and it's still black. I'm just saying, she's trying to kill me. She does this. But, you know, at least, we're, at least we're in the hospital. So I'm just saying there's a doctor somewhere. Anyway, so, all right. So one thing I want to talk about, and this is just thinking about the work with Latinx communities. And I say, I use Latinx here. I assume we're pretty much in, a, in an academic center. If one thing to know is that older adults within Latinx communities are going to make up about, what is it, 20%, 21%, 20 million older adults. And by 2060, we have many countries of origin. It's not just Mexico. It's not just Puerto Rico or the Dominican Republic. There are 20 plus different countries that we come from. There are definitely variation in race, ethnicity, uh, backgrounds. If we have US born Latinos, some of us, I know we are, right? Uh, who knows, we may be deported in November. Uh, immigrants, right? There's definitely immigrants, multiple generations. We speak multiple languages. I'm focusing on Spanish because that's what I speak. But we also speak, there are many indigenous languages, Portuguese, et cetera, right? And then we, one thing, this is one of my pet peeves, use whatever term you want, Latinx, Latino, Latina, Latine, whatever it is, and we'll probably get new terms in, in the next few years. But the point is to acknowledge that there is sexual and gender diversity. This is the problem. In the literature, sometimes people will just use the term Latinx, but won't acknowledge why. So we need to think about why we're saying these terms. We need to also educate. It's part of our responsibility. So we really want to represent, say why, don't just use the term. Attack me, attack me. All right, we also have to think about aging, right? There's gonna be about 95 to 100 million older adults in the US by 2060. Oftentimes, older adults experience a lot of chronic conditions, right? Loneliness, chronic pain, cognitive decline, these are all major problems. A frailty, bereavement, and loss, right? As you get older, you're more likely to experience somebody having died just because people are getting older. And discrimination or ageism definitely are prevalent out there, highly prevalent. At the same time, it's not all negative. Older adults are not, it's not all negative. You know, people tend to change their perspectives. They come to expect health changes, right? So they make up the best of those situations, right? Same thing with loss. Uh, they may modify the relationships. When you're younger, you want to have 20,000 friendships. You want to find a partner. When you're in your 60s and 70s, maybe it's about two or three confidants. Think the Golden Girls, right? It's about those, those high quality relationships. And wisdom. Uh, translating into Spanish speakers, eh, más sabe el diablo por viejo que por diablo, right? So the devil knows more because he's old and not because he's the devil. So wisdom comes with age, right? So that's important. So it's not all bad. That's one thing that I'm trying to get at. It's not all bad. At least I hope not. Eh, but what do we know about older Latinx individuals and research? We're definitely underrepresented. Well, not we. La older Latinos are underrepresented in research. There's definitely some documentation of health disparities, as I mentioned, cognitive functioning is a problem. There's limited attention to diversity. There are some calls for disaggregated analyses uh, looking at Latinos. I actually just uh, got some funding to look at disaggregated analyses in chronic pain uh, for Latinos, but there just really isn't much. Um, and then there's very limited discussion on how to do qualitative work with older Latinos. That's a problem for Latinx communities. And then it's even worse, of course, if we don't have the research, we don't have the interventions. So this is applies for loneliness, this applies for pain, this applies for depression, uh, caregiving interventions. We have relatively few interventions designed for older Latinos or Latinx communities. Don't cry, we're trying to make, we're trying to make progress. <laughs> All right, what else? So if you look at the literature and, you, and you know, we go with this question, how do we address diversity? There really isn't much. How do we answer this question? It's like, it's all fair game, just go, go out and try to do whatever you want. No, it doesn't work that way. But um, 
there's definitely uh, literature explaining what we should be doing, some recommendations for working with older adults, with working with Latinx communities, sexual minorities, but hardly anything that's like older Latino specific. Right? So the intersection is not very common. But you know, have a community advisory board, um, pay attention to language education levels, cover the travel costs, make sure that there's, they can get to the research site. Um, for older adults, make sure that you can stop and give them breaks so that they're not over, uh, they don't get too tired by answering your questions. Uh, for Spanish speakers, it's la plática, pay attention to familism, pay attention to respect. So using the formal versus the informal, and that varies by country of origin. I, I forgot what country it is, but it switches. I think it's El Salvador, I think, where it switches. There's also the voz, a different way of speaking Spanish. Uh, think about intersectional identities, right? So not all Latinos are foreign born, some are US born, some are American to begin with, Puerto Ricans. Uh, also pay attention to experiences across structural factors, right? Pay attention to education, uh, discrimination experiences and across systems of care. And then as for sexual minorities, definitely consider oppression and histories of discrimination. And it's not just their histories, but the intersection of all these experiences across the board and across the life course. One thing that's a pet peeve, uh, older Latinos and Latinos as a whole were, called, were considered hard to reach. That's a problem. It's very easy to blame patients, but we have to look at ourselves as researchers and clinicians and come back to us and think we're probably not doing a good job of out doing the outreach. But it's very easy to blame participants. Hey, they're hard to reach. No, 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 we're just not doing a good job. We need to fix that. Uh, what else? All right, so now I jump into the project and actually talking about some of these examples. Let me pause again. Any questions? Are we falling asleep? Do we need coffee? Spread that coffee around and people will wake up. Somebody ask a question. Online, do we have anything? No? Nada? Yeah, okay. Ah. Ah. It should work in theory, yes. Um, so you, you mentioned uh, Latino, Latina, Latinx, Latine, et cetera. And also I'm taking into account that you work with an older population in general. What has been your experience in the pronoun discussion and using Latin, Latine or Latinx and using the non-binary um, language with older Latino communities. And any tips that you have for that, like anything around that, I'm super curious. Yeah, very good question. And you're ahead of the game. I will be talking about that. But my basic standpoint is in academic settings, I'll use Latinx, right? Most of the people I work with are, you know, for example, the Dolores and Soledad, most of them had less than a sixth grade education level. It's very important to not come out there and say, hey, you are Latinx or Latinx. I jokingly say Latinx, right? Or chickenx. It's like, mm, let them describe themselves. Again, letting them empower and describe themselves as they see fit. Uh, it's paying attention to power dynamics. Again, in academic settings, they say Latinx. If I'm assessing for gender diversity, not just Latinx for the, for the fun of it. Out in the community, I'll say Hispanic, Latino, or whatever they want to identify themselves as. If they tell me, I, I will say I'm yet to, this is not the only study I've done across the years, I'm yet to run into an older Latino who says, I am Latinx, just say. So we got to be very careful about the terms that we use. Thank you for that question. All right, so this study is the Dolores and Soledad study. This was one of the flyers. Uh, this, we started recruitment during the pandemic, so that was fun. Uh, really quick background on loneliness and chronic pain. These are health priorities. These are research priorities. They are costly. There's definitely research showing that. Uh, chronic pain for sure is one of the top reasons why people receive or come to primary care pain. And both of these are associated with lower quality of life, poor physical and mental health, and subjective well-being. You see on the left, another shameful plug. This was a recent publication. We show that loneliness is related to cognitive functioning, right? You'll notice that there's some problems with measurements. Somehow loneliness was protective for Latinos. It makes no sense. Well, that's a discussion point. Uh, but ultimately, we have very limited knowledge about loneliness and even pain in older Latinx communities. Very few studies have actually included that or those groups. So one of the primary questions, and this, again, thinking about trauma-informed care, um, you don't see it when we write these papers up, right? So the primary question, what are the lived experiences? That's a very qualitative approach of loneliness or chronic pain in older Latinx communities. We'll talk about eligibility, Hispanic, Latino, 60 years and older. Um, you know, you give that, we use a three item UCLA scale. 
no significant cognitive impairment. We work with community agencies. This is all thought out, right? This is what you'll see on, online. You'll notice Facebook and Twitter, nobody came from there, but we did post flyers on there just in case. Um, you collect some demographic. I did train the graduate students. We had a lot of conversations about that. I'll talk about that. Uh, guided by the cultural formulation interview, which is in the DSM-5, we drew from there. We didn't ask the DS, the cultural formulation interview. And I did find for 50, at least $50 to give each participant, goodness. I mean, it goes a long way for them. Um, we did both phone and in-person. Ultimately, we got 35 interviews. They all lasted 45 to 120 minutes, the total process, right? So some people really had a lot to say. But what I really want to get at is answering this question, where is the trauma informed, right? So first thing, thinking about the method itself, right? Technically, I should go out there and collect quantitative data. I refuse, right? Let's start first trying to understand these problems. Let's have a conversation. So we need to allow people to tell their stories in their own words. That's part of that empowerment. Um, narratives is really about meaning making. One of the challenges here is that since most of the work is focused on westernized European white individuals, can we assume that pain is described the same way by Latinos? Can we assume that loneliness is understood and described the same way by Latinos? We shouldn't make that assumption. We need to question that, right? Not to mention, we have to think that during narratives, there's an interaction. It doesn't, they don't, narratives do not happen in a vacuum. You're there, you're interacting, you're helping shape that narrative and understanding that narrative. So we need to be willing to listen. The other thing is that Latinos are storytellers. This is very culturally appropriate for most of us. We're storytellers, but one thing is that we do not always tell stories in a linear fashion. We go forward, back, left, right, you know, 20 years ago, then maybe in the future. It's this idea of estar cantinflando. So, you know, you just, you're talking so much nonsense, you're meandering, and then you might get to the point 20 minutes later, right? So we got to be, you know, careful with that. I had a student once, once tell me, oh, that person has cognitive impairment. I'm like, no, that's just the way they speak. Relax, right? Um, one thing that's important about narratives and really qualitative literature as a whole is that once you start asking questions, uh, we lose control of their stories. They're the ones in control of their stories. So these stories oftentimes may include disclosure of tr potentially traumatic events. So we need to be very, very careful with that, right? This is partly why I'm also using trauma-informed work here. And where's it coming from? Also from previous work. Uh, this was a study we did with depression in Southern California. Of course, a lot of disclosure of potentially traumatic events, right? Elder abuse, loss, health challenges, it, suicidal ideation. Uh, I did have a man one time say that he wanted to shoot himself with a gun under his bed at eight o'clock that night. So definitely a thing, right? Um, poverty, and I'm talking about as experiences, not just having low income, but experiences. Jason, wake up. <laughs> Café, por favor. Este, so low education attainment, same thing. These are all experiences. These are not necessarily easily measurable. Immigrant stress, we're talking about not just being an immigrant, but the idea of having a loved one crossing the border, right? The potential loss, the ambiguous loss for some people. Um, and even when you're not an immigrant, family members are, you hear these stories. I've had family members crossing the river, you know, what is it, Las Aguas Negras, so this is basically where all the dirty water goes and crossing those rivers, right? And then violence, violence in the city, violence in their families, these are all things that come up, unfortunately. And then this was another one where I did talk about trauma-informed care uh, with older Latino gay men, specifically. So issues of rape came up, of victimization, of racism, homophobia, colorism definitely is a thing in Latin America that we need to consider. Now, since a lot of these folks are also immigrants, consider what's happening in Latin America. There's definitely violence, there's definitely political turmoil. So it's not just the US. We think of the context of the US, but you gotta think about the impact it has across borders. Okay? And then, all right, so this goes to your question, where is she, Adriana? Um, so just the conceptualization of the project itself, right? Starting off with some of these, uh, the terms, Latinx, Latino, academic versus community language. We need to be very intentional and mindful of this. Again, be inclusive of sexual gender minorities. It's okay to question theory. God, goodness, most of the time it's, you know, theory is not part of, every, every research project needs to have theory, but the theory does not to represent these older Latinos most of the time. So we got to think about what works, what doesn't. It's also very heterosexual, and that's personal. Heck, assume that I was going to get married at 25 and go to college. Many people never go to college. 
right? So we got to push back on some of these things. Again, the approach, we want people to tell their stories. Thinking about diversity, there's power in small numbers. Um, oh, Karen Stoller, a professor at the University of Michigan, talks about the power of small numbers in the sense that you don't have to have 30 in order to write in qualitative. You can have two or three, right? It's about these small numbers. The number is about how you're interpreting this. So we need to, uh, in research, there's this idea of the epistemological unconsciousness. There's so much focus on numbers and getting enough numbers. It's not about the numbers. It's like saying, well, there's only a small percentage of people who actually complete suicide, so we shouldn't think about that. No, it's important. It's important. So then, of course, uh, this was funded through a medical center, so I did have to think a little bit more medicalized, too. This is part of the navigating and rolling with the punches of academia. How do older Latinx adults make sense of loneliness and chronic pain? I'm looking at assessment issues. I'm looking at perceived causes, treatment, coping. How do people make sense of this, right? These were the starting points, but the conversations led to a lot more than that. Adriana, go ahead. Yeah, on, on your point of, obviously, it shouldn't all be about numbers. Um, how does that go with the NIH? Like, how does that go with getting funding when that is what, like, again, tips, tricks there, see, because I do see, know see. that that's, a, it's even just selling qualitative research sometimes to, to folks. I think it's gotten better, but I do know that there's very much yeah. a barrier there. So on top of it, having not just a qualitative study, but a qualitative study with quote unquote, only five participants or something yeah. along those lines, how do you So push? the thing is, yeah, so this is a very good question. This was a conversation I had years ago with mentors. So this study itself was funded, it was a two arm study. So one, we were looking at secondary data analysis, right? So we were proposing that, and then we were proposing the qualitative. And when I say, we still said we wanted 30, that's why we got 35, but 30. But when we do the assessments, we could still look at five or five or six or whatever when we're breaking down these data. So, yeah. But do push for the funding, do say 30, whatever it takes. Just, you have to roll with that. Get the money, then do the work, and then do the right work. Ed. Oh, did I hear something? I think someone online, go ahead. Jump in. No? Oh, was that a kid? All right. Feel free to interrupt at any point, folks online. I want you all as integrated as possible. Thank you. Yay. All right. So the conceptualization, this starts from the very beginning before I started collecting any data before, just thinking about the, uh, the proposal, right? All right. One important piece, I start off with my own reflexivity, but really this is something that needs to be done in all research, but rarely is done, particularly in quantitative. Uh, we really need to think about our critical standpoints, our own personal experiences, right? How are we looking at these data, particularly qualitative and even quantitative? What you study and how you study it and who gets studied is not a coincidence, right? We need to think about power. So when I was collecting these data, I was a postdoc, ooh, Cornell, Yay, great. But then you're, so some of these were collected out in the Bronx. Like, eh, it makes a little different. A lot of these folks did not have that level of education. It doesn't make you better than them. When you go, say, this, I said this to you on Saturday. When you go to the bathroom, it stinks just as bad. So no, it doesn't make you better, right? We're talking, we're starting off with humanity, right? Um, you want to check your assumptions, stereotypes. Oh, they, you know, nobody speaks English. Oh, they're all undocumented. They're all eating cats and dogs. Don't get me fired. So one thing basically I basically want to say here is that being Latino is not enough, right? Being Latino is not enough to connect with older Latinx communities. Um, reflexivity is important. There is no one method. This is a dispute in the literature. There is no perfect method of doing this. I will say how we did it. Uh, the way I did it in this project was uh, I had three research assistants. Uh, there were ongoing conversations, written exercises, you know, discussions. Um, in, Two of them were social work interns. They were MSW interns. So we had process recordings, but these were conversation starters. There were a lot of topics that we touched on. Perceptions of aging, uh, what does Latinx mean, Latina, Latino, et cetera. Uh, culture, diversity, gender perspectives. Two of them were women, what does that mean, right? And then common challenges and personal experiences related to the ones below. One thing that's unusual, uh, we're not machines, we should be talking about emotions. Do not be afraid of your emotions, right? And this is important because we're asking people to talk about their lives. And sometimes if they bring up trauma, what, what are you gonna do? It's not about you, but you should be prepared to listen to trauma. You might not be prepared to listen to trauma, 
So we need to be very mindful of that. Right? Sorry. Like, did I want to say something else? No, I don't remember. But anyways, so here's an example of uh, one of the research assistants. She was okay with me sharing uh, her, one of her reflections. This is a, a, a piece of it. Anybody want to read it? Should I read it? Oh, please jump in. Don't fight. <laughs> we have a mic. Anyone? There you go. Thank you. My grandfather worked in construction until he suffered an accident that left him disabled. A tree fell on his leg. After the accident, he worked at a supermarket, bagging groceries with tips as his only income. When my grandfather was left disabled, his employer promised to petition for his legalization if he would promise not to sue. This never happened. He was lied to and left disabled without any opportunity of compensation because he was undocumented. Thinking about the way he was taken advantage of fuels a rage, undecided if this is good slash bad in me. Looking back on this reminds me of a reminds me a lot of why injustices feel so personal to me and ultimately why social work resonates with me. Looking at my grandfather's life, I can recall injustice after injustice. He also did not have a support system that was able to provide him with the help he desperately needed. I'm not sure how or if he navigated the healthcare system or what his experience was with this. What's happening? How do we make sense of all that? Why does it matter? How do you feel by listening to that? How do you feel? How about people people online? Um, if you want to put into the chat one word or phrase on how that makes you feel, how that lands, you can start some of the conversation from there. Yeah. Oh, this was before. It was before and during. So this was one of the initial ones to try to understand why and you know what are your experiences in older adults, right? Disenfranchised. So, you know, these experiences, again, it's not just being Latino, but the cross generations, being a Latino immigrant, undocumented, power dynamics, people being taken advantage of. This is not so far fetched. It still happens. People are still having accidents and taken advantage of. People who are undocumented oftentimes are afraid of filing a report. They don't want to. They don't want to lose their jobs, right? So these are all experiences of the idea was, you know, okay, what does Latino, being Latino and coming from a Latino family look like to you, right? And this is just a small piece of it. This was like two pages the first day. So there was a lot to discuss. So one interesting piece there is she doesn't know if the rage is good or bad. I don't know. Like rage, it's normal. I understand it, right? The question is, what are you going to do with that rage? Um, this wasn't therapy, so we were not like, let's break that down, but it's as academics, what's our responsibility with that rage as advocates, what's our responsibility with that rage here left. Yeah. I mean, I would be very honest. I feel plenty of rage, but it doesn't mean I'm going to go beat up people. Right. It means we put it into the studies, we go to the research, we go to the clinical work, we do the advocacy. That's why I do what I do. But can she find it? Can she navigate? Can she channel that rage? Go ahead, Elena. And I was just, I wanted to note some of the thoughts we have online. We have disenfranchised, yeah. frustrated, disappointed, but not surprised, yeah. inhumane, unfair. Yeah. And yeah, rage, I think is. I mean, that's the thing. So feelings definitely navigate, you know, it. In clinical work, when we're doing therapy, this is a conversation all the time. So why would we expect that we, when we do clinical topics and research that that would change? You know, we're still dealing with people's complex experiences, real world experiences. We listen to death, we listen to, um, you know, disenfranchised situations. This is important. So we need to pay attention to our own experiences and how we feel. Again, not a common practice, but definitely needs to be discussed, right? Any others, we're good? Thoughts? You think this is dumb? Go ahead. <laughs> I can take it. <laughs> and I will say, I you know, I did send an email to a mentor uh, 
And I said, you know, it's Karen Stoller and so and so. It's your fault that I'm doing this qualitative stuff. But this is a conversation. We had many of these conversations, right? It's important to talk about this. So this is the way we did it. But again, ongoing conversations, even there were some things like um, this same student, well, now she's a therapist herself, but during one of the interviews, she asked, the participant was saying, yeah, my granddaughter's 22 and she hasn't had children yet. And my student replies, well, she hasn't had, stu she hasn't had children yet? I'm like, hold on, what's the assumption there? 22, what, she's supposed to have five children by then? What's, what's the stereotype there? Let's take it back, what's going on? So we had these type of conversations, right? What are the assumptions? There are a lot of assumptions that we just never check. I still have a lot of assumptions. That's what we gotta question that, right? All right, in doing research with older Latinx communities, there's, this is a list of problems that may come up. I can't talk about all of them, but I'm gonna focus on one that's most very, very common, right? The lack of trust. But you know, if you're working with older adults, don't be surprised if they say that they can't see Right? Sometimes it's because they actually can't read the documentation that you have. Um, immigration status, this is a major barrier, right? You need to decide whether you're gonna ask or not, and this is a problem. Um, whether or not they wanna be recorded, you need to have the option, especially in qualitative, whether or not they're, you know, you have to have a backup plan. Don't assume that everybody's okay with being recorded. And if they are being recorded, you notice that they're not comfortable, you may offer to turn off the camera, for example. Transportation, yeah, everybody should drive. Yeah, we need to get them there. So plan for that in your in your budgets. Again, disclosure of trauma. Don't be surprised if suicidal ideation comes up at some point. Consider, again, thinking about older Latinx communities. Many of them have never received mental health services. They have lived with chronic mental health conditions for a long time and never addressed them. So don't be surprised that every now and then somebody comes with suicidal ideation. Doesn't mean they want to kill themselves, but the ideation is there. That's a whole discussion. And then of course, thinking about abuse. Older, older adults, you have to have a plan there. As a social worker and a researcher, I'm a mandated reporter. So there had to be a protocol for that. Okay, but let's talk about trust. Why is that important, anybody? Can we just force them? Like sign the paper, take them. No, <laughs> it's okay to laugh. You know, I have to laugh at myself sometimes because some of these topics are so serious that you just, you gotta laugh at yourself. All right, so let's talk about trust. So there are a lot of challenges with trust. This is one of the main reasons I think participants or older Latinos and Latinos as a whole do not participate. So there were definitely several steps that we took that I wanted to take in order to build some trust, right? So first off, uh, for example, we were one of the community agencies in the Bronx. Make yourself available. I actually was in Baltimore at that point. I made my way to New York. Let's go up to the Bronx and show your face, right? Who are we speaking with? You're not just, they don't want to just talk to you over the phone, be there, right? So I did a presentation to the group. They literally were having their breakfast and here I am having a conversation with the older adults. And then after that, they were also sending coffee. So not that I like coffee, but I had to have my cafecito. It's not the cafecito itself. It's let me sit down and acknowledge your humanity. Let me show you that you are important, right? So taking that time to sit with them. This is part of that personalismo, the, you know, just being humane. Um, not in this study, in a current study, to me, it's just so interesting that one woman said to me, oh, you know, the most important thing is that David acknowledged my humanity. And I'm like, what the hell? That's a problem. If at the age of 60, 65, that's, you know, they haven't been acknowledged as human beings. This is a problem. Um, of course, we talked about uh, transparency. So I am very comfortable, as I just did here, disclosing my own experiences, my background, right? Um, talking about diversity in English and Spanish, I was dealing with a multicultural group. Right? people from different countries. For those of you who do not know, Spanish is not the same across countries, right? Across, even within the same country, there's variation. Um, I did explain why we're doing this research. Be very transparent because I wanted to understand these concepts, want to develop interventions. This is a problem. I was a caregiver. I don't mind sharing that. Like, that's part of me. That's just why I do the work. Now, one important piece here is that you must only share things that you're comfortable with. So if let's say you lost a grandparent recently, you're not gonna go up there and say, hey, it's because I lost my grandparent and you're gonna start crying. No, 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 that's probably not a good idea, right? So I have a reference there. Watts Jones talks about incorporating location of self and transparency in clinical work. Some of those things still apply to doing research, right? So we gotta think about what we're sharing. It has to be purposeful and it cannot be a crisis for you. 
Uh, we also want to acknowledge privilege and differences. Yeah, we're Latino, but there are a lot of differences. I have people from Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic. Um, we recruited in New York, LA, Baltimore. I think there were a few, there was one person from New Jersey and somebody who didn't provide us her ad, like her location. But uh, so they're all over the place, right? These, they're large cities, but they're different. Balt Baltimore's not really a large city. <laughs> it's a large, it's a city, right? So these are different, right? But we gotta think about shared identities. What are the histories of universities, right? Sometimes universities have unfortunately taken advantage of uh, certain groups. Let me not get into all that, but there's definitely a history, right? Um, so we wanna check our ties to academic institutions and think about our own experiences. I mean, I'm US born, I had many more opportunities than many of these folks did. Acknowledge that privilege, right? So we did have conversations about that. And again, the point of that is to bring them up and say, no, your stories are important. Let's empower. I want to listen to your point of view. My point of view is not better. I want to understand you, right? Empowerment. Does that make sense? No questions, concerns? Call up bullshit or something? Any thoughts? What do you, I see you writing down notes. I don't know. <laughs> Nick, are you going to share this? Reactions? Yeah, I guess kind of one of the questions someone who's not experienced do you feel that we need to take a step back so communication is not always verbal right it's not always what you like the language that you're using I think you need to be transparent and be very clear why you're doing what you're doing, right? So if you're genuine as whatever other background you, you come from, if you're genuine, genuinely trying to connect and, and support the community, they'll read into that. They'll pick up on that, right? If I go in there and say, just tell me this information because I want to write a paper because it's going to help me only, even if I'm a Spanish speaker and Latino, that's not going to work. So yes, language is important. You could get an interpreter. I will say in this study, one of the, um, one of the research assistants She's third generation uh, Latina. Her Spanish was, but she was very genuine and warm. So she was able to connect with these participants. And when she didn't understand something, I said, ask, have a conversation about that. It's okay not to know. You're not, it's not supposed to be perfect. We're not perfect. We're human beings. It's okay to talk about these differences. Did I answer your question? Just a, I was gonna um, chime in here uh, that they couldn't really hear the question. So I'm just gonna kind of yeah. paraphrase what you just said. Essentially, there was a question asking about what the process is for um, people that want to be involved in this work, particularly with the Latino community that don't necessarily speak Spanish. And um, as Dr. Camacho went over just now, there's more to communication than just verbal communication. And I'll also add in that Spanish is not the only language that people from Latin America speak. And I think myself included, I, I ignorantly forget that often. So I do want to make yeah. note that there's, Spanish is also the language of the colonizers and we have yeah. very much, um, don't take into account a lot of the indigenous <sighs> languages that people do speak yeah. as well. This is a major problem. I mean, I've, read, I've been on one or two papers from Mexico specifically. Um, there are other languages spoken in Mexico, but they're not represented in the literature. So at the very least, we call it, we need to call them out in when we're publishing these papers, right? We don't still not paying attention to that diversity. But yes, it is a colonizer language, but this is also the language I speak. I'm a product of that, right? So I do what I can, but I'm certainly not. Oh, now that's it. I'm going to quit. No. Just being real. Just no. being real. And that's yeah. the thing. That's just the reality, yeah. right? And along the same lines, there are some Latinos who speak English and that's okay. So you can't definitely communicate with them, right? So uh, again, thinking about uh, their expert knowledge, right? If I ask any of you, you are the experts in your life story, right? Same thing with them. You don't need a college degree for that. You don't need a PhD. You are the expert. We wanna acknowledge that. We also wanna acknowledge their wisdom, right? Oftentimes there's ageism already internalized. Oh, you're old, you're no, yeah, who cares about what you have to say? You know, go take care of the grandchildren, otherwise you're worthless. That's a problem, right? So we wanna acknowledge their wisdom. We wanna think about their abilities to influence future generations and future healthcare, right? In thinking about research itself, the steps, 
uh, we have to think about the processes, like the consent forms, right? Let's explain these. Let's have a conversation about these. Let's be as transparent as possible. Yes, this is done all the time, but do not assume that these older Latinos are going to be able to speak the medicalized language, right? Keep it as simple as possible. That's pretty straightforward. Be transparent about what will be done with these data. What are you going to do? Well, I'm going to be presenting it. I, Based on some of this I presented in Spain a few months ago, I told them, you know, one, a couple of them that I was presenting on their, on their stories, on their experiences in Madrid at that point, because it's nice for them to know that their stories are getting out there, right? Um, I definitely didn't inquire about citizenship, right? I wasn't gonna say, hey, tell me what your citizenship status is, but some of them, there's other ways of finding out. So for example, if you ask whether or not they have Medicare, you know if they're um, U.S. Uh, citizens or, or citizen, they have documentation in the U.S., right? Incentives, I put that as an exclamation point. Um, this is a problem in the way we do research in institutions. We, for example, at Cornell was being asked, in order for people to get incentives, they needed to provide their name, their address, their phone number, all their private information. Yeah, that was a problem because guess what? This wasn't told to me until afterwards, so it wasn't in the consent. So, you know, now I need to understand where they're coming from. Well, some people may not want to provide that information. So there was some pushback back and forth about that. But I learned from that. For the next study, I said from the very beginning, you will be asked for your information. If you're comfortable with that, then we could proceed. Otherwise, it's okay if you don't participate. Again, transparency, right? But, and this also shows that Research systems are not set up for those who are most marginalized. So again, being mindful of that. Um, and again, safety protocols, thinking about, oh, and what I mean by safety is if somebody discloses trauma, it's like, oh, too bad, bye. No, no, no. You can always do a warm handoff, right? So think about what if this person needs mental health care services? What are you going to do? Who are you going to connect them to? Is there a social worker? Because we do everything. Is there a nurse? How are we going to get this person connected? And I say that particularly with Latinos because there are many barriers to getting mental health care services. So we need to think about actually connecting them to appropriate services, right? I say it's part of the research. Yeah, we could just cop out and just give them a, a handout and say, call this number. But we also know that oftentimes they experience many challenges and probably won't get an appointment. So we need to be mindful again of those experiences. Don't do the bare minimum for research, do what's right. Two very different things oftentimes. That makes sense? No pushback from the audience? No good to say, ugh, too much work. All right, and also thinking about um, how we start conversations about diversity. Well, it's again, interacting with trust and building that foundation, the respect, right? Um, anybody else wanna read this, this very basic script and tell me how it links to empowerment and respect and diversity? Go ahead, Adriana. Sure, okay. Um, thank you very much for agreeing to participate. This interview will help us begin to understand the experiences of older Latinos. We acknowledge that Latinos are diverse in terms of country of origin, sexual orientation, gender, race, and even immigration histories. We want to be inclusive and respectful of these diverse experiences. We will ask you questions in a style that may be different than what you are used to. However, please remember that your answers are confidential and, can, and you can refuse to answer any questions. If you do not answer a question, please ask. I will do my best to clarify the question. Please note that there are no correct or wrong answers. We are interested in your experiences, views, and opinions. Do you have any questions? The actions to this. We said mostly this in Spanish, but I figured I would present the English version. What are we doing? I have a question in terms of um, the word confidential versus like anonymous. Like I, I know that in research studies there have been issues before on what technically is defined as confidential. Yeah, a confidential, and it, as long as you are not telling me you're gonna kill somebody, kill yourself, there's any type of abuse, it's confidential. Yeah, I describe it like that in the consent forms. Yeah. Other thoughts? Go ahead, Pilar. What are you thinking? Yeah. 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 
Yeah. It's, you know, we're talking about this diversity. We're saying we're going to ask some of these questions. They may not be used to it, and that's okay. And if you have any questions, ask me. Let's have a conversation. It's not like you're supposed to know how to answer everything, right? It's not about right or wrong. Again, conversation, saving your own words. Be free, feel free to ask. And this, again, goes with a lot of them have low levels of education. They're afraid of not answering correctly, whatever that means. Yeah. And on Zoom, we have um, someone sharing that we are setting ground rules for the study. Yeah, so there's just setting the tone, right? We want to be respectful. I set that on purpose, right? There's a lot of diversity. Um, and of course, this did, I mean, this did, this was right before the, um, the quantitative aspect of the, of the study, the data collection of that. But then still, we repeated something similar when we did the qualitative portion. But again, building some uh, foundation for exploring diversity. We want to do that, right? Building that trust, normalizing. And if you look at the literature asking about diversity, um, Jason here, we were looking at the literature and what's been done about sexual orientation. Most of the work is done with people who already identify as sexual minorities, right? So asking and talking about sexual orientation, well, it's different for them than it is for uh, to ask in a supposedly mostly heterosexual uh, center, right? So we need to have these conversations, uh, but that's not the norm. So we want to prepare the participant. And for us as researchers, we need to normalize asking some of these questions. And if we are uncomfortable, we need to wrestle with that discomfort. Right? Why are we feeling uncomfortable while I'm talking about sexual orientation? I've had students say, oh my God, my grandma's 80 and she has sex. I'm like, good God, sex is normal. Relax, right? So these are the kind of kind of conversations that we need to have. Adriana? Oh, I thought you were like, or you were gonna start singing or something. I, don't know. I would if I could, but I'll spare everyone. Be loud, please. Yeah, hopefully. I mean, we're trying. We need to get some publications out of this, but Jason, <laughs> no pressure. Um, all right, so one of those questions that we ask, we did it in Spanish, but most of them were in Spanish. Do you consider yourself to be heterosexual or straight, uh, bisexual, gay or lesbian? Another category, not other, like to other uh, people, but a different category. And if they didn't answer, well, is there a reason why you didn't? I could say that nobody refused to answer, right? So one, that already shows that we can ask these questions and nobody's gonna freak out on us, right? So how do you think people reacted? Yeah. Yeah, and we have a question here. Um, is there any option to opt out of the study at any point Yes. they are uncomfortable? Yes, yes, that's the thing. In the consent form, that's one of the points. You could drop out at any point, there will be no penalty to you. You still get your monies, that's not a problem. But yeah, and they could always refuse to answer. They didn't, for example, they didn't feel comfortable with this. They could just say, I don't want to answer that. And that's that. Moving on. Not a problem. Thank you. Cassandra, I see you. Thank you. Not after they started doing the interviews, no. Okay. My question was if anyone dropped out midway to, back, to piggyback off of Emily's point. Yeah, no, I don't think so. No. So how do you think people reacted? Let's see. So one thing is that these are questions. Sure, you could quantify them and say 70% said this, 30% said whatever, right? And sure, most of them identified as heterosexual, but that's not the important piece. If we are really thinking about being inclusive, we have to be inclusive of those who are not, right? So we've got to think about that. Uh, what's important here is that there was an emphasis on understanding and having a discussion. This is what Jason and I are gonna be working on, writing a paper specifically about how people responded to these items, because it's really touching on perceptions of sexuality, touching on perceptions of how they understand these concepts, right? Uh, stigma, homophobia is alive and well, right? Still there. And then what you see at the bottom there is a response from one of the participants. This was a woman in her late 70s, I believe. Um, and I asked her about sexual orientation and her response was, 
uh, I, I don't know how to tell you or what to tell you because I'm a woman and well, mm, no, right now, I don't think of any of that. I don't, I'm past those things. What's happening? Any idea? Past those things. Possibly. Is it past the language or past like putting myself in a box? Or go ahead. So one thing, yes, thank you for it. So she's also a widow. So she's a widow. She hasn't had any sex in God knows how long. So she's past that, those things. So she's assuming that sexual behavior defines sexual orientation. You don't stop having a sexual orientation, even if you're a virgin, you know, you still have a sexual orientation, right? But in her perspective, it's, you know, since I'm not sexually active, therefore I'm past those things. It's not a thing. Yeah. And someone in the chat says menopause. That too. As a potential. And not that, I mean, I'm not going to speak for women, but I'm assuming that just because you have menopause doesn't mean you stop having sex. Some, you know, nursing homes are still doing it, right? So it's important, right? Thinking about those assumptions. Uh, so we got to think about, uh, you know, so there's a lot of, we're, we're taking out these answers and trying to understand them. You know, what are some of the responses? Because what I really want to uh, push here is that we should be asking about sexual orientation and gender in older Latinx communities. You know, we should be talking about these things. Uh, there are, there, there is definitely a study going on through the University of Washington looking at LGBT aging. Yes, Latinos are represented, but not the low income immigrant as much, right? We need a lot more looking into that diversity. Those are only a few studies. She's, Dr. Frederick Golson is doing great work at the University of Washington, but we need more work on these older Latinos. ¿Qué más? Oh, we asked about country of origin. Um, so we had a kind of different representations, Ecuador. You know, most of the literature on Latinos focuses on Mexico, uh, Dominican Republic, um, Puerto Rico. We don't have much on Ecuador, El Salvador, right? Uruguay, it really isn't that, you know, I don't know much about Uruguay, but hey, let's have a conversation about it, right? I think that person was actually a master level teacher, so different level of education. A lot of the folks uh, were living in the US more than 30 years, so they were not recent immigrants, though we did have like two or three. Uh, one woman in particular um, was a recent immigrant and she was also homeless and she had been separated from her family because of the pandemic. So it was a big problem. Uh, we also have one or two uh, military veterans. So US born military veterans. So we have to acknowledge these differences, right? And make sure they don't get deported, goodness. Sorry. I'm just saying, I'm a little concerned about this whole, you know, November 5th, 6th, whatever day it is, right? So all that to say that there's a lot of diversity, right? We need to talk about these differences. Um, for example, Puerto Ricans are not immigrating to the US, they are US citizens, right? So that coming to New York or whatever uh, part of the US is much easier than it would be for somebody crossing the border from Mexico, for example, right? So we got to talk about those differences. And one important piece here is that it's okay for you as a researcher not to know. I prefer cultural humility. Just because I'm Latino doesn't mean I understand every single Latino person, right? Let's talk about similarities and differences, assumptions. Hey, tell me about what it was like to live in the Cerro somewhere. Like, I don't know what that's like, right? Sorry, up in the hill somewhere. Yeah. Based off of your work with, based off of your work with, with these folks, did you notice um, or did they disclose like going back to their home countries often? So desire to go back. So during Desire, yes. Some of these were during the pandemic, so they definitely couldn't go back, right? Mm -hmm. um, some more recent ones, they would go back, they visit their home country, Puerto Rico, for example, or the US, but they go back, visit. Now, the thing is, again, thinking about aging, one particular woman had lost her husband, had lost her father. Uh, so even though she had lived in the US and LA for 30 plus years, she, would, she tended to go back. But now that people started dying, she doesn't have anybody to go back to. So it's just, it's, again, it's, yes, there's a desire, but they are now used to being in the U.S. So, yeah, again, what does that feel like? The humility, tell me more. Okay, that's, I'm trying not to be a Debbie Downer, come on, people. <laughs> uh, let's see. Oh. Um, yeah, so cultural humility, right? So it's okay to have these conversations, and that comes back to the beauty of qualitative. 
in quantitative work, give me the answer, give me the answer, give me the answer, give me the answer. It's like, you're really getting at the nuances. That's the beauty of qualitative and narratives, right? You're really breaking it down and letting them tell you their story. So I learned a lot about these things. In other studies, Devin, with older Latino gay men telling me about how, remember one man talking about how they didn't have running water, so he would go take a shower in the river. I'm like, I never knew what that's like, you know? I do know what it's like to go back home uh, with family to Mexico and then the, the water runs out, but it's not the same, right? Being in touch with nature. Uh, and then just because we are talking about trauma, just in case anybody has any questions, anybody want to read that one? Microphone. Go ahead, Adriana, sing it, no, sing no, it. No, I'll, I'll put Cassandra on the spot. <laughs> trauma resilience. Well, yes, doctors told my children. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Let me back this up a little bit. So let me give a little backstory. So this woman um, had 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 multiple chronic conditions. She was about to go on dialysis and she had two strokes uh, prior to this. So she's referring to the last time she had a stroke and that influenced the way she was looking at her life now and her pain. So yeah, sorry, go ahead. Well, yes, doctors told my children that I was not going to live that I was going to be a vegetable. But look, I'm here speaking and all. I've gone through so many pains that it is no longer which one is stronger or weaker. I've gone through so much worse pains and they have resolved. And with God's will, as long as I have my support and they help, I'm grateful to God all the time, all my life. 79 year old Mexican woman. What do we see? I mean, the topic is pain, but what do we see? There's God so much is mentioned twice. Why is, how is God important? Why is God important? Well, yeah, both. With a sense of faith, like I am, you know, although I'm in pain, I think the, the thing, the theme here is that religion um, is tied to resiliency. In her case, yeah, it's a coping mechanism, right? I'm thankful. And she doesn't want to die. She, but at the same, it depends on how you view it. So this woman um, lived by herself. A, she had two children, um, but they wouldn't visit her that often, which was part, she had three children. That was part of the feeling lonely as well. Um, but she just was grateful to be alive despite the stroke. She was gonna be a vegetable. So she's just happy to keep breathing, right? And she could deal with the pain and she was there as long as God was willing to have her there. So it's in God's hands, right? So that's that fatalism, whatever God wants. Um, but it also shapes the way she's looking at pain. Eh part of life it's part of coping right so it's how people make sense of the pain pain itself is not going to lead to suffering it's how people make sense of pain that ultimately contributes to whether or not a person suffers so this just was one of the many stories that we got many pieces of it but these are very very complex right these narratives are extremely long they talk about so many things and perceptions about that um okay thoughts other thoughts no does this make any sense for those who are nurses is, is this how you assess pain? What? It's usually what? Do you have pain? Yes, no, and? <laughs> yeah, so that's the thing, right? So this is another paper I wanna write because when I asked those questions, right, as part of the screening, but then they told me this whole full story and descriptions about their pain. Sometimes in the morning it hurts like this, but then when I get up and have my coffee at the cafe and I start moving, it gets a little bit less, but then at night, I. You know, so it varies across the day, right? So how we assess this and the distress. So really we should be looking at pain interference. We should be thinking about how it impacts their functioning, not just whether or not they have pain and how they rate it, right? That's under your thinking. It resonates a lot with my own experience of um, being a sunscreen uh, really validated. I'm glad. And these are things you have to tell these stories. That's the thing. We have to tell these stories, right? Um, so the pressure I feel is that I need to get these stories out in publication. And also, be glad we have these conversations that part of being trauma informed and thinking about diversity is that, yes, it's nice for me to publish this, but I don't want these to stay in academia. We got to get out to the community and present these out in Spanish at the very least. So, yeah, yeah. more work. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so what am I getting at? For those of you who are doing clinical work, clinical research, um, main story again, we need to think about trauma-informed principles. This is very helpful in addressing diversity, but also thinking about the history of diverse individuals, thinking about experiences, right? 
anticipate disclosure of trauma. And I mean disclosure of potentially traumatic events, right? Um, this also started coming out from another study where these older Latino gay men started talking about their sexual experiences. I think I touched on this before, but they talked about their sexual experiences when they were young. Some of them viewed it as just a normal part of being an adolescent and others viewed it as I was raped. And one of them in particular realized he was raped during our interview. So that's just the disclosure. The question was not about their sexual orientation, their sexual behavior, it was just something that they all talked about. Uh, we also have to think about discrimination and what that looks like, right? Across the life course. Um, violence, definitely disclosure of domestic violence. Uh, domestic, is that domestic violence, health challenges, right? Uh, frustration, I hear these stories and I think of my own family, right? My own trips to the emergency department. So it's, I'm not immune to those feelings. So in one of the other papers I wrote on how I needed to calm myself down during interviews, right? Because sometimes the stories that you hear can lead to strong emotional reaction. But because it's our responsibility as researchers, as clinicians, it's not about me. You gotta make sure to remain calm, right? Then afterwards, you can let it all out, Adriana. And what, yeah, thank you for saying that. That was one of my questions kind of as, as you wrap up. What, what, again, what tips, tricks do you have? Like, what do you do to be able to take care of yourself in doing this work? Because even, you know, listening to all of this and very much resonating with it in so many ways already has, again, validation as Cassandra says, but also has like my heart already racing faster and, and taking it in. So I can only imagine being right in person. What have yeah. you learned with your experience in doing this for as long as you have? You're already at the next slide, but yes. <laughs> You're just jumping ahead, but let's get into that. Let me, yeah, so strong emotions, we need to anticipate them both for the participant and for ourselves, right? Um, so this is why we need the reflexivity piece. Again, thinking about what works for us, right? So thinking about our own trauma and our own emotions, how do you cope with strong emotions? What do you do? Do you go work out? Do you have tequila? Do you have coffee? What is it, right? I'm not recommending one or the other, but you got to find the appropriate coping mechanism for you, right? And I learned this very well when I used to work in the emergency department. Fortunately, unfortunately, I saw a lot of death. It was a trauma center. So gunshot wounds, those kind of things, right? But to me, and again, being very transparent, I saw my parents die and other loved ones die. Seeing some a stranger die is not as bad as seeing your parents die, right? So there was that comparison. So I was able to steal my nerves in that sense. I was a little more calm in that sense. But I'm not going to lie. I had you know some patients where uh, I remember one kid completed suicide. He was 15. The whole family was outside. It was a whole you know mess. After that, I got in my car. I was driving home like at two in the morning, and I was screaming. I was singing. I was. I had to let it out in one form or another. It was very frustrating. I absorbed all those emotions, right? They were asking about how are we gonna get him back to Mexico? We can't afford it. We want him to bury there. How are we gonna do this? So I absorbed it, but then you have to find ways of letting it out. That's the bottom line, right? But that's individual. Go ahead, Adam. No, yeah. So we gotta think about those emotions. We gotta think about our own histories. Um, I, do, I did do, do this a lot. She might be listening, Dr. Bhattacharya at the University of Washington. We were at Columbia together. We had a lot of these conversations. Her work is with Indian women and mental health, particularly domestic violence, more recently looking at schizophrenia, women who are hospitalized. So there's a lot of personal work for her too, right? So we talked a lot about why we did the work that we did, and we're very clear of why we do the work, right? So any, and she does a lot of qualitative work. So before going out to the field, we prepare ourselves, right? Anticipate that some of these things may happen. Um, Again, the transparency, if you're going to share with community stakeholders, you need to be very transparent. Tell them why you're doing this, right? Um, you want to have conversations. How do you enhance safety for your participants, right? That could be the immigration thing. It could be the, uh, um, I don't know, do I have $50 for them to make sure that they get home safely, right? Do I, am I willing to pay an Uber for them? Can I do that? Um, for example, I was in the Bronx, not the safest of neighborhoods, right? So we had to think about some of that. Um, you have to take steps to avoid harm, make sure not to, for example, along those lines is sometimes people will disclose trauma. The reason I had early on that exposure to traumatic events does not mean PTSD. One thing that's very important is people will talk about bad things that happen. You know, don't assume that it's PTSD and that they can't self-regulate. 
right? So give them a, some space to regulate. Instead, because otherwise, sometimes people will say, oh, that's too hard for me to understand. So I'm just going to ask a different question. Let them tell their story. Let them self-regulate. That's also important, right? I think there could be harm in not letting them tell their story. So I mentioned earlier that a man realized that he was raped during our conversation. Remember, he said he had the power, not me. Shut up. Say nothing. You're there. You're being supportive non-verbally. Let him regulate and then continue his story. So we got to check ourselves in terms of what are our assumptions about safety, trust, and trauma and disclosure of trauma. How comfortable do we feel with that? Right? Do you get a lot of training in nursing on trauma? Is, yeah. is it the same? The reflexivity, yeah. Good. Kind of weird. Yeah. It's necessary. And definitely in nursing literature, it's definitely there. It's just, I think it needs to be done across the board, not just in qualitative or in nursing. Right. What else do I have up here? Uh, yeah, again, shared identities is not enough. Culture humility as a practice. Embrace the diversity. Embrace that you don't know. It's okay for you to say, I don't know. I'm more, I have more of a problem with any student researcher who says, I know everything, because that tells me they know nothing. Assume that you know nothing, then that helps you realize that maybe you're aware and that you, know, you probably know more than you think you know. So we want to let them know, well, I don't understand what it's like to be Puerto Rican and live in San Juan. I don't know what that's like. Tell me more. Have a conversation, right? Or what was it? Oak Park and Little Village in Chicago. Right? I don't know what that's like. So let's discuss this diversity, right? Again, empower them. We should be asking about sexual orientation, gender. I think there was a question for uh, Adriana that you sent me. Somebody asked about, are there differences, subgroup differences? Yeah. Many. I haven't looked at each one, but one thing that I think really stands out is gender. These narratives are very gendered. Women in these narratives oftentimes said, you know, they didn't go to school. Their whole life revolved around taking care of family, taking care of their children. So when they get to older adulthood, if they don't have any grandchildren or, or their children are grown, they have no purpose. This is an effing problem, right? A lot of this has to do with education perceptions that you as a woman do not have. You're 65, let's say you're done. It's like, chances are you're going to live another 20 years. We need to start changing that narrative. And it's very gendered, right? For men, it's like, you stop working and then you're done. It's like, no, we got to start changing and questioning some of these things, right? What does healthy aging look like for older Latinos? You know, I have these issues at other schools where they're like, oh, you know, you become, a, you become 65 and then you go travel the world. Mm -hmm. That's probably not going to happen. And even what is, what does healthy mean? Yes. I think that that's also like a conversation to be had that we don't talk about enough of just kind of having yes. a yes. standard I don't know, a, yes. a standard way to look at health when that. So yeah. health for a long time was the absence of disease, an absence of right. having conditions, right? Well, does that mean that once you develop diabetes, you're never going to be healthy ever again? Does that mean if you have depression, you're never going to be healthy ever again? So more recently, maybe in the last 15 years, the two continue a model thinking that even if you have a chronic condition, you can still thrive. That's the goal. It doesn't mean that because you have, I don't know, hypertension, that's it. You might as well just lay down and die because you're never going to be healthy. No. The idea is that, especially as advocates, as clinicians, as researchers, we're trying to help people thrive within their context, whatever that means, right? Even towards the end of life, people are going to die. We're all going to die. We know that, right? We're all going to die, but how people die varies, right? So there's literature on how to have a good death, what that means, and that's personal, right? So you need to think about that. So even to the point where we're dying, how do we die healthily, if you want to put it that way? Eh... Let's see, so we should be asking about diversity. We should be asking about gender, sexual orientation. Do not be afraid to ask. Nobody's gonna bite your head off and if they do run. They're not going to most likely, right? But there might be some. And then if that's the case, then you handle that situation. Okay, I understand you're frustrated. We don't have to answer that question and moving on, right? You learn something from that interaction. Right? It, even if they say, oh, how dare you call me a fag or whatever it is, whatever term you wanna use, don't hang me for that or cancel me for that. People say different things, right? Well, that's telling you something. Their reaction is telling you something about that interaction and that their life experience, right? So think about the future because this was an emphasis on diversity. We need to normalize conversations about diversity. That is the norm, right? And this is why as one of the field supervisors in my class, DHC 400, the assignment is, let's think about diversity. You know, how do we bring in intersections? 
enough, no offense, I'm not, I'm assuming certain things, but enough, the status quo is not white, heterosexual, cisgender individuals, right? Especially men, they are not the go-to. There's so much more out there. The US is not the center of the universe. Let's get our butts out of our head, you know, our, our heads out of our behinds, right? There's much more out there, right? So let's ch uh, check our assumptions. Let's think about how people live lives. Think about diversity. We need to break that down. And we need to have these conversations in peer reviewed publications. Where is the discussion about diversity? What are the assumptions? How did you address trust? How did you engage these older Latinos? Was it just Hispanics from who knows where? Like, we need to talk about that diversity. And then again, dissemination. We need to bring this out to different communities and have these communities, uh, community presentations. And I think I have all this. Um, and I, are we out of time? I think so. I, I think I'm done. But please ask questions, please. Thank I'm you. We've, my we've, coffee. Yeah, we've got about seven more minutes. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Questions from questions from the audience, both in person and online. Thoughts, questions, comments. Yes. In terms of you know, you talked about the trauma and it's also about loneliness and it's also at least some of it during the pandemic. And I was wondering like, how like how did you navigate that in terms of like, especially if these are people who maybe are particularly isolated because of the pandemic, and you're talking about loneliness and you know, if, if, they, if they aren't, don't have a support structure and they're talking to them for two hours, like was there, what was, what was the handoff looking like for that, as opposed to like maybe your medical issues, referrals, or were you finding a lot of times that it was like hard to kind of end the conversation because you're like, oh, they, I'm the person that they have to talk to at the moment. Um, I wouldn't say it was difficult. They talked about all of that, right? So like definitely in terms of the pandemic, there were definitely discussions. One man mentioned he lost 15 people during the pandemic. We have to remi remember that Latinos were disproportionately affected by the pandemic, right? So for example, one other woman, um, she was living with her family, but this is where you get the nuances, what poverty looks like during the pandemic. She was unemployed, uh, undocumented, she did disclose that. And even though she was in the home as an older adult, she didn't wanna to interact too much because let's not get sick, right? But she was also concerned about her daughter-in-law who did get hospitalized during the pandemic, lost one of her lungs, she was concerned about the grandchildren, who was going to take care of the grandchildren. So we had a lot of conversations about loss. and these. So we had to have those conversations, right? It wasn't easy. Again, this is why I study things all together, because they, this is how they happen in the real world. I'm not going to say, just tell me about loneliness and nothing else. That woman in particular, her loneliness was not really, she was not isolated, right? Though to a certain degree she was, because she would eat her breakfast, lunch, and dinner in her bedroom, because she didn't want to you know, well, she wanted to interact, but there was also, they only had three chairs for a family of six. So she had to take turns, right? So there were little things like that, but ultimately she wasn't isolated, but she felt lonely. And her loneliness, this is for a different conversation, but loneliness is not all the same. We have social loneliness, we have existential loneliness, we have emotional loneliness. Her source of loneliness was the loss of her husband. That's where, so that whole conversation and the loss of her mother, she also talked about crossing the border as an undocumented person recently because her mother died in Mexico. So she decided to go back, bury her and then cross the border. Crossing the border as an older adult, probably not the easiest of things. So there was a lot, there was a lot, a lot. Yeah, sorry, I don't know if I answered any of your questions but it's just all, you gotta roll with the punches at the end of the day but that's what you do in therapy too. So for me, it was like, okay, we'll stop here and then we move on. <laughs> Thank you. Other thoughts, questions? Well, okay, so people on Zoom, feel free to unmute or um, stick a question in the chat and we'll make sure to address it. Um, any other questions here in person though, or thoughts? I'm like, Jason, you have a question, what? <laughs> that the whole, I mean, no. sorry, yes. Thank you. I mean, I, well, it's not so much about, I hope we start conversations about this. We need to have these conversations, right? Because like any of the categories, since most research is quantitative, it's like we group everybody together and it's really about experiences, a lot of diversity, you know, um, uh, 
Dr. Aranda, one of my mentors from LA, from USC, we were sitting at a conference and it was like Puerto Rican, Puerto Rican, Puerto Rican, Mexican, and somebody else. And it's like white, mixed, and black. It's like, oh, but we're all Latino because we're all the same. Like, no, there's a lot of difference here, right? But we're all Latino or Hispanic. That's where we would be placed in the census or whatever. It's like, there's a lot of diversity there. We need to start breaking that down. So, yeah. Fun stuff. Yay. To, to, to end on something light, um, what, in all of the years that you've been doing this, what keeps you doing it? What's kind I'm of only the 25. most- 25. Fulfill- you are, time. you're 15 I'm young, actually. I don't know. What are you talking about? What's the most fulfilling part for you? The fulfilling is listening, uh, trying to get these stories out there, trying to problem solve. I don't see myself retiring. I was telling you this over the weekend. I don't see myself retiring. There's too much work to be done. Heck, I want there to be services for me when I become an older adult. You know, that's the bottom line. We need to develop these services. It takes 15, 20 years to actually get services out there after they're tested and so forth. So we got to accelerate dissemination. There's a lot to do. So hopefully I'll be that older folk and still writing about whatever, you know, so. Well, thank you. Thank you. (laughs) Wrap us up really quick. Um, Miigwech. That is one way to express thank you in Potawatomi. It expresses a desire to reciprocate again in the future. Miigwech to Dr. Camacho, miigwech to the Odette Center team, Cassandra, Samina, and Makeda, and our OVCH partners, Michael and Brian. And miigwech to all of you, both in person and online. Bama pi mine, or until another time. In Potawatomi, that means, uh, it, that means until another time in Potawatomi, as there is no word for farewell, as we expect to see each other again soon. Thank you so, so much. And um, we put in the chat a feedback form. If you all could please fill that out. That seriously helps us so much in knowing what to do next and really being able to push for these, this kind of program. And we will also share here in person so the folks in person can do it. But thank you so much. And thank you again, Dr. Camacho. Thank you.